You can only imagine what it would be like for a man sitting in a cold, damp medieval dungeon waiting for the interrogation that is sure to come. His brain races with images of limbs being stretched, of feet being dangled over flames. So when a harmless goat is walked into a cell, he's somewhat taken aback. His interrogators proceed to dip his feet in salty water, after which the grateful goat, not one to turn away from a generous helping of salt water, enthusiastically licks the man's feet. At first it feels quite pleasant, but after a lot of vigorous licking, the feeling becomes unbearable. After an hour, he's ready to tell the interrogators anything they want to know. Did this really work, you might wonder? Could it even lead to serious trauma? All will be answered today. It sounds pretty ridiculous, but tickle torture has been written about throughout the centuries. That goat scene we just described was penned by an Italian jurist and monk named Franciscus Brunus de San Severino. It was part of a list of tortures he mentioned in the 1502 classic Tractatus de Indicius et Tortura. But did it really happen as he described? That depends if you think that monk had a reason to make things up, or someone was messing with him and told him lies. He also mentioned bloody kinds of tortures in that book, with the tickle torture one of those not supposed to cause the victim too much harm. Nonetheless, as you'll see later, maybe being incessantly tickled could do a fair bit of damage. In fact, some people have talked about the existence of what they called death-inducing tickling. First, let's go back to ancient history. We can find some second-hand accounts of Chinese tickle torture. It was said to be a thing during the Han Dynasty, from 206 to 220 AD. It's written about in a book called The A to Z of Punishment and Torture, which explains that Chinese nobility back then used it as a method to interrogate people without leaving any marks. Still, there's not much evidence of it happening in China, so we should look elsewhere for proof. We know it almost certainly happened in Britain, although the tickling was just another part of torture. For centuries all over Britain, when a person committed a misdemeanor crime, the go-to punishment was the stocks. In fact, just about every town and village had some stocks for wrongdoers. You can find them all over the place today, although they don't get used. The stocks were usually in place where lots of people met, like the market or the town square. While in the stocks, if the person had sufficiently annoyed the public, people would approach them and do things, such as cover them in rotten fruit or animal poop, or maybe they'd even hit them with a stick. But what the youngsters back then found quite amusing was going up to the victim and tickling their feet. Since there was no way out, you can only imagine how it would feel if the kids kept on tickling for quite a while. There's actually an article that was written in 1887 called England in Old Times. It described the good old days. One part of it reads, Gone too are the parish stocks in which offenders against public morality formerly sat prisoned, with their legs held fast beneath a heavy wooden yoke, while sundry small but fiendish boys improved the occasion by deliberately pulling off their shoes and tickling the soles of their defenseless feet. In fact, it seems tickling folks in the stocks was quite common. In 2016, a town council counselor in England named David Bretherton made waves when he suggested using the town's stocks again, although not for what you might think. In an interview, he said sometimes what they used to do was take off their shoe and tickle them with a feather. Perhaps for charity we could do something like that. Get people in the stocks and have others donate money for the time they last while having their feet tickled. So yeah, it was done in the UK, but not for the life of us can we find a reported case of death by tickling. Still, there is no doubt a darker side of tickling. It's reported that in ancient Japan there was a practice called Kusiguri Zime. This translates as merciless tickling. Yet again though, there's not much evidence other than one book which describes the act. Still, there's plenty of evidence that suggests tickling could definitely be called merciless. We know this in part because of a guy named Heinz Heger. In 1940, he was sent to the Sachsenhausen concentration camp and was later transferred to Flossenburg concentration camp. In 1945, American troops liberated the camp. Mr. Heger had kept a journal throughout his ordeal, with the last entry titled, Amerikaner get kommen. This means Americans came. Those journal notes of his later became a book called The Men with the Pink Triangle. Pink was a reference to his and others' homosexuality. In that book, he describes how Nazi soldiers would torture camp inmates by tickling them. We'll let him describe in his own words what it was like just to prove to you that being tickled against your will is not very nice at all. This is what he wrote. The first game that the SS sergeant and his men played was to tickle their victim with goose feathers on the soles of his feet, between his legs, in the armpits, and on other parts of his naked body. At first, the prisoner forced himself to keep silent silent, while his eyes twitched in fear and torment from one SS man to the other. Then he could not restrain himself and finally he broke out in a high-pitched laughter that very soon turned into a cry of pain, while the tears ran down his face and his body twisted against his chains. When the ordeal was over and the soldiers left the hut, Hager said the victim sobbed for a while. Then there was a book written by a professor in the US named Vernon Wyhe. He investigated many of the terrible things that go on behind closed doors in families. We've all been tickled by an older brother or cousin, and it's just been funny, but at 
sometimes people have taken tickling too far. There's a point when tickling is far from friendly. During his research, why he discovered that tickling had indeed been a kind of torture in many of his interviewees' lives. It was reported that sometimes when it went for too long, it led to the person losing control of their bladder. Others reported that they couldn't breathe, while why he wrote that tickling could also lead to a loss of consciousness. In 2013, German scientists wanted to know why tickling could be very unpleasant. Using MRIs of a brain, they discovered that tickling stimulated the same part of the brain that goes off when a person thinks pain is on the way. When you tickle yourself, your brain knows exactly what's coming, which is the reason you can't tickle yourself like someone else can. Imagine a small insect crawling over you. It tickles and you brush it off. That's a positive thing because some small insects can do nasty things to your body. Your brain receives messages from your nerves and it's a good thing in evolutionary terms. It's just not good when you have too much of this feeling. It becomes an overload of sensations. In fact, scientists have talked about two types of tickling. One is nismesis and the other is gargalesis. The former is the light tickling that might make you laugh, and the other is the heavier kind of tickling which might make you hate your older sister for a few minutes. It's this constant heavy tickling that becomes a kind of torture. You only have to imagine what it would feel like if the tickler did it for a long time and you had no option but to take it. But we guess even the light kind of tickling would be terrible if someone had to endure long periods of it. There's a book by a Jesuit priest named Tomasz Wosferowski. In it, he describes how the communist Polish security forces after World War II used tickling when they interrogated certain people. Part of the text translated from Polish reads, On the second floor of barrack number 10 through the whole week, 1st through 7th of May 1951, almost constantly, day and night, a laughter of a tickle-tortured woman who begged to stop tormenting her. Apparently even the neighbors complained about the noise. Then there was the story of a hospital attendant named Frank A. Sanders. His story was reported by the New York Times on September 6, 1903. It was said that while this guy worked at the Hudson River State Hospital, he amused himself by tickling the feet of a restrained patient. Still, this is a far cry from death-induced tickling. Does such a thing actually exist? We found a parenting website that said, there are documented cases in which unrelenting tickling has resulted in death, but no documented cases were provided by the writer to back it up. Of course, excessive tickling of someone who is already frail would be a very bad idea, but death by tickling alone in a perfectly healthy adult? We doubt it would happen. People have in the past been reported as dying from laughter, but the strain on your body and underlying symptoms no doubt played a part in the deaths. Still, as you guys have seen today, tickling is no laughing matter when it's against our will and goes on for too long. Some people, of course, pay to have that done to themselves, but that's another story. Now you need to watch how people literally laugh to death, or have a look at crazy things a doctor removed from inside a person's body.